to this GDS side event called ensuring that indigenous people and minorities with disabilities are not left behind in COVID-19 recovery efforts, building new partnerships to meet urgent challenges. This event is organized by the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network, the International Disability Alliance, Minority Rights Group International, and Vidas Negras con Deficiencias Important. I am now going to briefly explain some of the features in today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded. There is international sign interpretation. We have also language interpretation in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Live captioning will be available in English on the Zoom platform on in Spanish, Portuguese, Nepali, Ukrainian, and French via the stream text in the chat box. Kindly take a few seconds to enable the language of your choice in the language options at the bottom of the screen. There will be an, an option, mute original audio, but please do not select this option because if you select this option, you will be uh, losing part of the audio. So let's take 10 seconds and you can select the language of your choice in the language option. We welcome questions from the audience and ask participants to use the Q and A &A function, which will be moderated at the end. Speakers, please remember to turn off your microphones and cameras when you are not speaking. The event will be running for one hour and 15 minutes with no scheduled break. Well, um, welcome everyone again. My name is Rosario Galarza. On behalf of the International Disability Alliance, welcome you to this study base. I will be doing the, moderate, the moderation with my colleague from Minority Rights Group, Lauren Avery. The widespread ratification of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has seen progressively realization in many contexts. This has been on account of the advocacy of the disability rights movement, led by organizations of persons with disabilities, as well as inclusive program being supported by international cooperation. However, for those from marginalized groups, including persons with disabilities from indigenous communities and from ethnic, linguistic, and religious minorities, the enjoyment of rights has not reached the same level as it has for others. Persons with disabilities from these communities often face additional barriers to knowing and accesses to the rights and participate in civil society. They experience discrimination on the basis of disability and also discrimination that pervades society on account of their ethnic and indigenous status. This puts them at risk of remaining the farthest left behind as we move toward the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. This side event at the Global Disability Summit is a historic, is, is a historic moment for the indigenous persons with disabilities global network, which is a network of indigenous persons with disabilities that was initiated in 2012 as a caucus to promote the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities. I am happy to inform you that this caucus now is, is engaged in international and regional human rights processes. And it has the support of the Secretariat of the International Disability Alliance. We are optimistic that this edition of the Global Disability Summit will see greater acknowledgement of the concern of indigenous persons with disabilities. Going over 
the commitments listed under the Charter for Change in 2018, we found just one reference to people with disabilities affected by multiple forms of discrimination. And there was little mention of intersectionality issues experienced by persons with disabilities from indigenous or other minority community. Of the 968 individual commitments made by the stakeholders under the Charter of Change in 2018, only two commitments reference to indigenous people and three commitments reference to minority groups. Therefore, it is really urgent that governments and other stakeholders recognize the need for intersectional, intersectional approaches on the rights of persons with disabilities, particularly as they invest in develop in COVID-19 recovery plans. There is a need to give weightage to the requirements of underrepresented groups addressing intersectionality and to also support partnerships with other social movements. Um, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague um, from Minority Rights, Lauren. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Rosario. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be joining you all here today. Uh, thank you especially to Rosario and IDA colleagues for helping to organize the event, as well as our co-organizers, the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network, and Vidas Negras con Deficiencia en Porto, uh, the GDS Secretariat, and the wonderful interpretation and captioning teams who are helping to make our event as accessible as possible today. Uh, just to recaption what um, Rosario said, so the foregrounding work of the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Network work and IDA over the last decade is really reflected in the GDS 22 themes and commitments and we can see the progress made since 2018 in recognizing the need to address intersectionality in the disability rights movement and reaching the most marginalized people with disabilities. So at the summit in 2018, uh, I, along with others, made a pledge under the only commitment which made a reference to underrepresented groups of persons with disabilities who face intersectional discrimination. And so it's a real pleasure to be here today uh, at this side event with some inspiring disability rights leaders from these underrepresented communities. Uh, as Rosario said, it's very exciting to see the commitments this year make specific reference to ethnic minorities and under underrepresented underrepresented groups facing intersectional discrimination uh, and seeing that uh, the importance of a coordinated approach to promoting the rights of these groups is really being highlighted this year at the summit. So the global pandemic both exposed and ex exacerbated intersectional discrimination, especially to those belonging to ethnic, religious and linguistic minority communities who faced additional barriers in accessing information uh, in their own languages, healthcare services, education, emergency support uh, and in accessing their basic rights. However, the pandemic also has provided a very strong civil society, uh, a very strong disability rights movement with an opportunity to meet these issues head on. And it was during the pandemic that new movements have arisen which champion the voices of those who until recently have remained invisible. We are very lucky to hear from representatives from some of these movements today, including uh, the Black Disabled Lives Matter movement. Uh, and just to wrap up, as highlighted yesterday at the Civil Society Forum, disability inclusion is not only the responsibility uh, of organisations or persons with disabilities or persons with disabilities alone, but it is very important for other social movements and related organisations to join and fight for disability rights alongside uh, and to be led by organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, so thank you very much. I will now pass uh, back to um, Rosario to continue introducing our speakers. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lore. Uh, let's start 
with our wonderful speakers that we have here. And first, uh, let's start with Manasen Tutu. Manasen Tutu is from Kenya. Uh, he's a leader representing indigenous persons with disabilities with experience and advocacy from the grassroots to the international arena. He is co-chair of the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network. And also he's the chairman of NARO Soft Disability Network as a member of the National Council of Disability in Kenya. Um, Manasen, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I, I can only say uh, to every one of us, uh, members of the Indigenous Global Network, and IDA, minority right groups, and all the secretariat. Uh, let me just say this evening, hi to everyone. Uh, on my side, as the president of Indigenous Persons with Disability Global Network, I'm very happy today to welcome Global Disability Summit 2022 not forgetting uh, many people who lose their family during the catastrophe pandemic for the two years since 2020. Many families have affected many people. We have lost members of our families. We have lost uh, disability people, losses of job across the whole world. Today, we have faced a lot of challenges uh, in every work we are doing in, in our respective countries. So we are joining families of indigenous people, minority groups, persons with disability around the world, and we are standing with them at this difficult time. In disability movement of the indigenous people, I would just like to remind every one of us that we have a long way to go and we have work to do. Remembering our people, our different disability members all over the world. And today, uh, as a co-chair, I will always uh, welcome GDDS and open officially that every one of us in every country you're watching, in everywhere you are, feel free to speak or even to text whatever you want to give us. We welcome you in this meeting. Let's join hand and let us move and change the whole world and make sure we are living in a better world where reasonable accommodation apply to every one of us. May God bless you as we continue with this meeting. And as I know, as, as the end of the meeting, we will have one common agenda or one common thing to do in 2022. Welcome everyone, men and women, children, civil society, let's join hands and change the whole world. Be blessed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Manasse, for this invitation to build together this common agenda, a common agenda in which indigenous persons with disabilities can be, can be included in all the fields. Now we are going to uh, present our next speaker, who is Pratima Gurung. Pratima Gurung is from Nepal, is the General Secretary for the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network and also she's chair of the National Indigenous Disabled Women Association, Nepal, Nidwan, and a faculty member of Padma Kanya College in Kathmandu. Pratima will be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 on indigenous women with disabilities in relation with the GDS commitment and including the barriers to participation. You can go ahead, Pratima. The floor is yours, and please uh, remind that you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rosario. And I just 
uh, want to apologize uh, because I'm having some throat problem since yesterday. So thank you uh, to all of you, to all the organizer for this wonderful event. My indigenous greetings uh, and good evening from Nepal. I'm Pratima Gurung and I'm very much honored to be in this rich discussion, discussing on the second uh, Global Disability Summit, highlighting the impact of COVID-19, especially on indigenous people and women with disabilities uh, in Nepal and uh, in Asia. So my, my presentation will be more focused about the situation of indigenous people uh, with uh, disabilities uh, in Nepal and Asia. And if you look at the whole dynamics of indigenous people with disabilities who have multiple and intersecting identities, uh, we would say that there is still a lack of recognition. Indigenous people are still not organized within the institutional structures. And when I say institutional structures, we have two structures. One is the traditional structures of indigenous people that are traditional customary institution. The other one is being a person with disabilities that is organization of person with disabilities. So indigenous, most indigenous peoples are not within these two institutional structures. And that is why there is lack of understanding within a uh, person with disabilities about the nexus of disability, gender, indigeneity, caste and ethnicity when it comes to minority groups also. So we see that in most countries where indigenous people reside, the majority of the population of indigenous peoples are uh, in those uh, countries. And when we look at those uh, majority of the population and their rep recognition and representation, we find that their status are not in the mainstream. And that is why we realize that there has been a lack of education, awareness, health, employment, lack of data, effective and meaningful participation, both at private and public sphere, are some of the features of indigenous people with disabilities around the globe and also in Nepal. We are 28 million indigenous women with disabilities and 54 million indigenous people with disabilities around the globe. And that is why the multiple and intersecting identities further makes a compounded form of uh, discrimination at several layers. And there is also uh, commonalities and departure of the collective rights versus individual rights. So these are the basic uh, features of indigenous people with disabilities having indigenous identity, disability identity, and when it comes to indigenous women, it is also the gender identity. During the COVID, we have found that the issue of right to self-determination of indigenous people with disabilities have been violated. And that is where we see there is lack of information uh, among indigenous uh, people with disabilities. The issue of reasonable accommodation and accessible formats within the disability discourse has been dominant, but when it comes to indigenous and women with disability, indigenous women with disabilities, mother tongue language becomes one of the prominent hindrance for indigenous uh, people with disabilities. And this has really very much been crucial at the time of COVID. We also saw that there is lack of access to relief, recovery, medicinal and counseling support for indigenous peoples and women with disabilities. Most indigenous people with disabilities lack birth registration, citizenship, disability card. And that is why the relief package that has been provided by government, including other civil society organizations, has not, have not reached to indigenous people with disabilities. The issue of unemployment and livelihood became very much crucial during the time of COVID. And most indigenous people were very much shocked by the sudden lockdown because language barrier and access to information became very much prominent to them. 
we also found that there is there was an increased rate of violence and abuse and attempt to rape for indigenous girls and women with disabilities as a result we found that the family members including indigenous people and women with disabilities had psychological stress and, and anxiety during the covid pandemic the data also shows this reality. There was a study done by a National Indigenous Disabled Women Association in Nepal. The interim impact assessment of COVID-19 underrepresented indigenous Dalit, Madeshi people with disabilities. So it included not only indigenous people, but also the other minorities people with disabilities. And the data clearly outlines about 91.13% of these underrepresented groups experienced social and e economic impact during the COVID. They were also very much uh, impacted by the sudden lockdown and those impacted communities are 84%. We also found that 78% of these indigenous people, including the other minority groups with people with disabilities also experienced psychological stress. 57.38% of this underrepresented reflected the need for food. And also some of the participants during the study, like 55.44 highlighted that they did not receive any kind of COVID relief support from the government. Ultimately, the last data that I wanted to highlight is 92.38%. Indigenous girls and women with disabilities faced violence, abuse, and discrimination during the COVID pandemic. This data is a very alarming data. And when the Global Disability Summit is happening at this moment, if you look at the government of Nepal, commitment towards the Global Disability Summit, the first agenda that our government has committed is ensuring dignity and respect for all, inclusive education, economic empowerment, girls and women with disabilities, conflict and humanitarian context and data desegregation. Apart from that also, we see that the National Federation of the Disabled Nepal, which is an umbrella-based organization, also has made some kind of commitment. But if you look at all these commitments, we see that there is a huge gap of reaching the most marginalized groups, which include indigenous people, including minority people with disabilities. So the Global Disability Summit has to look from a very comprehensive and broader framework. This is what we have realized. There has been some kind of progress to person with disabilities, and that also includes indigenous people, including minority people with disabilities. However, those attempt efforts from the member states, from the disability constituency, from the CSOs, and from all the relevant stakeholders have to have certain targeted intervention. This is what the ground reality uh, shows. So I will just come to my last um, slide where we see that how do we move forward? So the Global Disability Summit uh, 2022, on behalf of the indigenous people with disabilities and minority groups with disabilities, we would like to request to recognize the rights and respect of indigenous and minority groups with disabilities. The disability definition has to clearly mention indigenous people and minority groups with disabilities or have to be framed under underrepresented groups. And this is one of the missing gap that we realize at the national level. So member states have to take these efforts. We also need to understand the collective rights and right to self-determination of indigenous people with disabilities, which are crucial at all levels. Meaningful participation and engagement with the organization of indigenous people and minority groups with disabilities are crucial. Desegregated data, intersectional approach, partnership, collaboration is urgent to all the member state partners and OPDS. And by, by doing all these efforts, we realize that 
all persons with disabilities, including indigenous people and minority people with disabilities will not be left behind. We hope to achieve that leaving no one behind not only means for a few people with disabilities, but for all people with disabilities. And we hope this collective efforts have to collectively owned, respected, and realized by the second Global Disability Summit. I thank you for listening to me. Rosario, over to you. Thank you. Okay, I am trying to open my camera, but I think I cannot. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Pratima. Definitely, it's very important what you are mentioning about uh, the commitment that we need to, to make and also about the situation of indigenous women with disabilities. Okay, very important, very inspired also uh, speech. Thank you so much also, Pratima, for being so late. I know it's very late for you in Nepal, but thank you so much for being with us in this important and very historic event. Okay, now I will pass uh, the floor to my colleague, Lauren. She's going to present our next speaker. Thank you, Rosario. And thank you again, Pratima, for joining us and for those very insightful observations and the call to action uh, to the delegates of the Global Disability. Summit. I hope that they will uh, take notice of, of uh, your, your ask of them this year. So I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker. Uh, her name is Luciana Viegas. Uh, she is an autistic activist, mother of an autistic child, and a teacher at the State Public Network of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She is a member of the Organization of Persons with Disabilities, uh, Abraça, and one of the creators of the Brazilian Black Lives with Disabilities Matter movement. Uh, she is also the president of Vidas Negras com Deficiencia in Porto. And today, Luciana will be speaking about how intersectionality reflects on the lives of Black people with disabilities disabilities in Brazil. Luciana, the floor is yours. I'm trying to turn on my camera, but I'm not. So let me try a little more. There you go. Now it is on. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here participating in this event and be able to hear many perspectives about how persons with disabilities are seen and how, how we are seen all over the world. I'd like to speak a little about how during the pandemic this process was in Brazil. I'm going to try to open and share my screen with you. Let me see if it works. So as a little introduction, I'm a teacher. I work with education in Brazil that here in Brazil we call inclusive education. I have been a teacher uh, for more than 10 years. Before I knew I was a person with disability, before I had a child with disability, I have always been interested in this theme. And then later on, I started to understand more of this reality. I'm going to read this excerpt from a writer called Lelia Gonzalez because this is a very important excerpt to describe a little where our questions come from. So Lelia says this, racism in Brazil, who said this? This is an American thing. Here, there is no difference because everyone is Brazilian above everything else, thank God. A black person here is well treated. They have the same rights as we do. That is, if they work hard, they will have a better life. I know a black person that is a doctor. He's so polite, cultured, elegant, and he has such a fine facial features. He doesn't even look black. 
So this excerpt from Lelia Gonzalez described really well what racism is in Brazil. So despite being a very unequal country, and even though most of our population here is black, here, the less black you look, the best it is. So this dynamic works with us persons with disability as well, especially us who are black persons with disabilities. So I'd like to talk a little about how this has occurred during the pandemic. What happened, in fact, what, what actually we faced during the pandemic. So the first point that I'd like to highlight is that during the pandemic, persons with disabilities were extremely excluded from the educational process. And this was very strong and evident for us. So I have a child with disability, I'm a teacher, and I always remember that we didn't have technology, we didn't have guidelines. We only, there was only a dynamic of exclusion of these persons in remote education. So persons with disability, they didn't get to participate in educational process during the pandemic. I think that it was very difficult for everyone, but for persons with disability, their rights to experience this was totally denied. And all this process of exclusion takes place because we, persons with disability, we are marginalized. We are in the periphery. And this is very difficult because we do not have access to certain technologies. And since we didn't have this access, we didn't get to study. We didn't have the right to education. It was not insured. There were some dynamics of trying by some governments to try to remedy this, but we cannot repair a historical inequality in only two years. So we persons in Brazil, we are in a vulnerable situation. We are more prone to violence. And during the pandemic, there were many cases of persons with disabilities who were violently approached by the police and killed. And most of them, most of them were black persons. Another important data is that according to an organization in Brazil, which is the prison system in Brazil, more than 70% of the prison population with disability in Brazil, more than 70% of inmates in Brazil, they have intellectual disability. And also many of them are women. So we have many questions regarding this. Where did this intellectual disability come from? Who diagnosed it? What were the conditions of this diagnosis? Why most of these people are in prisons and not included in society? This is a debate that is ongoing here in Brazil. Another important data regarding the race and disability movement is that according to some census, 83% of residents of psychiatric hospitals are black persons. The data that we have here in Brazil, they intercross, but they are very old data. We do not have like recent data about black persons with disability. We do not have quantitative data about where we are. And during this pandemic, a new request has, a, has arisen. Where are black persons with disabilities? Where are they? And because of this, we have the Black Lives with Disability Matter movement. It is a movement that originated during the pandemic to try to answer these questions because the system is racist and also ableist. It is formed by Black persons, Black per, uh, persons with disabilities and mainly 
Black persons with disabilities. We fight for these inequalities to stop. And when we think about social justice, we need to think about Black persons with disabilities because what we understand as a group, as a movement, is that we cannot advance in this fight if we do not bring race to the debate, especially in this country where the majority of the population is Black and a great part of the population is formed by persons with disabilities. And within this whole dynamic, we had many denouncements of violations against persons with disabilities, especially Black persons, the rights of Black persons. One of the things that we have noticed a lot during these two years is that the pandemic has made underdiagnosis of Black persons explode, increase a lot, and especially Black persons from, from this construction of a movement that is anti-racist and anti-ableist. So basically we have, we are amidst a pandemic with Black persons understanding their spaces and understanding their place in society and fighting for their rights. So this debate is a debate of many questions, especially here in Brazil. This debate is a debate of many questions and few answers because unfortunately we need to construct a dynamic where the movements for social justice, they need to go through persons with disability and they need to understand that persons with disability need to be racialized and because they are being left behind in this process. We are literally dying. Here in Brazil, we already have two big reports of persons with disability black persons that were killed because race came first when the police understood that that person didn't want to collaborate and so the police killed these people so this is why we say that it is very important to speak about this movements must understand this and must fight for social justice regarding this population, because here in Brazil, this population has been historically decimated, historically erased. So let me see. That's it for now. I have one minute to thank everyone. I'd like to thank the invitation from the MRG. I'd like to thank the opportunity of being here to talk about how this movement takes place. We have a lot of fight ahead of us. We need to organize us ourselves so that no one is left behind, especially persons with disability, because unfortunately in our country, they are killed for nothing. And a case that took place during the pandemic was a case was the case of a mother who was the caregiver of her child, a child that needed a big support, and she died suddenly. And then his her child was hungry and died as well. This case was very big here. And in this case, the basic was denied to them during this terrible pandemic. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have you here talking about this topic that sometimes in the events, we don't talk much about this topic. And we need to reflect about how important it is to, to have this intersectional approach. Because I mean, if governments and other stakeholders can have this intersectional approach, maybe 
we can improve the lives of most of persons with disabilities, especially because we need to make sure that we need to exercise full uh, our rights. Okay, thank you so much. And um, also, uh, greetings to the, the Abraza organization, which is really great. I, I know most of the members and definitely they are doing a really great job. Thank you so much, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Well, now um, it's my pleasure also to welcome to our next speaker. is Mr. Padam Perrier from Nepal. Mr. Padam Perrier is an active disability rights advocate a development professional for 19 years with life physical disability experience promoting disability inclusion and rights in Nepal. Despite of belonging to poor Dali family, facing various untouchability and caste-based discrimination, he is currently leading the CBR Community-Based uh, Rehabilitation National Network of Nepal, and he's the national coordinator. He is also currently working for Inclusive Development Partners USA for the multi-country study on inclusive education. Father will be speaking on the situation of Dalits with disabilities in Nepal during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please, uh, Mr. Padan, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Rosario. Um, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosario, for introducing me so nicely. And uh, thank you, MRZ, IDA, and all the organizers of this uh, important uh, event, side event of the Global Disability Summit 2020, um, 2022. Um, uh, and it's my uh, honor to speak uh, about one of the very uh, you know, great uh, minority section, which are called Dalits. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, to, to share about their situation. Uh, let me, considering the time, let me directly go to my presentation. Uh, just a moment. Well, um, Okay, so um, uh, in this 10 minutes, uh, we will be uh, talking, learning about uh, who are Dalits. Mm, and uh, we will be also, uh, you know, uh, learning about the different uh, type of uh, discrimination and discriminations based on, you know, uh, ethnicity, caste or disability and other you know uh, <clears throat> terms and we will be also asking ourselves whether caste matters within the disability community or not we will be definitely talking about uh, why there is a big ignorance from the state and then the non-state actors uh, for such a big uh, minority groups and we will be also talking about uh, what would be the possible uh, ways forward um, to address their problems. So just in short, let me uh, tell you something about who are Dalits. I, I'm sure you might have heard about uh, Hindu religion. <clears throat> so uh, in the Hindu religion, uh, so there is a caste, hierarchical caste system and there are basically the four, you know, uh, different caste. Uh, at the top, they are the Brahmins, who are the priest. And uh, at the, you know, the down level, uh, there are uh, Chhatris, who are the, you know, safeguards of the country. And then there are uh, Baisya, who are the, the trade persons. And at the bottom, there are uh, the Sudras, 
who are the you know dalits who are also known as dalits and in india it is known as scheduled caste regions and in nepal uh, dalit achut silpi and nich jati they are also uh, let me not say it, because i also belong to the same community so we are also uh, considered as untouchable people meaning if uh, if we give let's say if someone wanted to have uh, drink water from us then the water is not pure if we give them offer them a glass of water so this is the traditional thought uh, towards the uh, uh, dalit people and uh, and this this community is suppressed uh, for more than 3000 years it's not just you know few hundred years but 3000 years so uh, this is the you know short uh, introduction of who are dalits and uh, <clears throat> if you see some data uh, about the dalits globally there are more around 260 million dalit people uh, in india the, uh, around 16.6% uh, population are from dalit community 13.6% population of nepal are Dalit uh, people um, among the Hindus, uh, there are huge number of you know population in Pakistan uh, the, in, in, uh, who are also Dalits. And um, the scheduled caste, 45% uh, of the scheduled caste who are also known as Dalits uh, are landless in India. And there are a huge number of 89% of the Dalits from the Tarai region, which is neighboring to India, are also landless, and they are also, you know, uh, the huge number of Dalits are also under the poverty line. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, uh, Dalit population in India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and other, you know, different uh, South Asian countries. Um, this is the few, uh, you know, database about uh, Dalits. And now let me go to uh, the people with disabilities from Dalit communities, who are one of the, uh, you know, uh, biggest uh, marginalized uh, community uh, in Nepal, India, and South Asian uh, part of the globe. So. Dalit people with disabilities, they are uh, facing multiple, you know, layer of discrimination. Uh, persons with disabilities, Dalit people with disabilities, they are facing discrimination on the basis of disability. And they are also facing uh, discrimination on the basis of caste. And uh, Dalit women with disabilities are also facing uh, you know, uh, discrimination on other, you know, gender and other identities. And if you uh, see um, among the uh, disability community, uh, so there are around 330 organizations of persons with disabilities in Nepal, and not even a single organization of persons with disabilities are affiliated with its uh, federation. There are few organizations registered, but they are not in a capacity to affiliate uh, and fulfill the requirement of the federation. The issues of the Dalit with the disabilities is hugely neglected by the disability community itself within the Dalit community and, uh, and, and other civic society organizations. And we all know that there is a vicious cycle of poverty, disability, and caste. That's why uh, Dalit uh, people with disabilities, they are uh, so severely you know, marginalized. And uh, from the Nepalese context, Dalit women with disabilities and uh, the uh, Madesi Dalit uh, with disabilities, they are mostly marginalized and uh, they, uh, they need urgent, uh, you know, supports and empowerment initiatives. Basically, the issues of uh, Dalit with disabilities, they are uh, taken as a blanket approach. 
Okay, we, we, we are talking about Dalits. So the, the issues of the Dalit uh, with disabilities comes under Dalit. Or we are talking about the, the uh, disability rights. So the issues of the Dalit with disabilities comes under the, the you know, uh, disability rights. That's the blanket approach. And that's not true. In all the time, uh, the blanket approach doesn't work for the minority section or for the you know, uh, specific communities like the lead with disabilities. Uh, and uh, when we talk about the GDS commitment in uh, 18, uh, they I didn't find any specific uh, intervention or any specific actions planned to address the, uh, this, this type of needs of the Dalits with disabilities. And talking about the impacts of uh, COVID uh, to the lives of uh, Dalits, uh, so 48%, around 49% faced caste-based discrimination during the, uh, you know, uh, during the COVID uh, while distributing the different relief materials in province two of the country. Uh, there is a, there is a, uh, you know, less access uh, to healthcare and information. Uh, in few cases, there, there are uh, there are instances that uh, uh, Dalit with disabilities are deprived from uh, treatment uh, during the you know COVID uh, period. Sixty-five percent of the persons with disabilities in Bangladesh lost the you know household incomes during the COVID period. So if we uh, see some data, uh, uh, eighty percent, around eighty-one percent of people, you know Dalit people. Uh, uh, in Nepal faced food crisis uh, and they also lob, lost their job, 45% of them lost their job. Um, and uh, similarly in Nepal, 56% women with disabilities, they reported that they were abused during the uh, COVID uh, in Nepal. So these are some of the you know, uh, facts, how persons with disabilities and particularly the Dalit with disabilities are you know, impacted uh, during the COVID uh, situation. And there are a few uh, you know, uh, good lights, good uh, practices as well as uh, we are talking about the Dalit with disabilities and uh, one of the uh, biggest problem is on touchability, uh, caste-based discrimination. Uh, so this this issue has been well addressed uh, by the government of Nepal, the, the government of India, is because the uh, caste-based discrimination is legal in these areas, uh, in these countries, and uh, there are. I, I was not able to make uh, um, you know in depth the research of the other countries, but at least in Nepal and uh, India, it's illegal. So uh, other good practices are there are you know good uh, legal uh, instruments such as disability rights act uh, regulations CRPD different pro programs uh, for persons with disabilities um, not of course you know targeting for the with disabilities but at least we have the you know fundamental uh, legal frameworks. Similarly, one of the biggest uh, you know, achievements or good practice is uh, that there are reservations for the scheduled caste in India and uh, reservation for Dalits in Nepal in employment, education, and uh, political you know, areas or while they are you know, uh, providing different services. In terms of participation, uh, there is one persons uh, with disabilities from Dalit community uh, representing in the National Federation of the Disabled Nepal. And uh, there are also a few Dalit uh, persons with disabilities who are leading uh, some of the OPDs. Uh, but the OPDs particularly working for the uh, Dalit persons with disabilities are not in a, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a capacity to affiliate uh, with uh, NFDN, the National Federation, and other networks. Let's talk about some realities, but uh, we haven't been able to realize. Uh, disability, we know that there is a 
huge diversity within the disability community. And basically we talk about impairments, the type of disability and other identities, uh, disability identities, uh, such as um, uh, the, from the minority groups or from the indigenous identities are not well you know, received. Uh, that's one uh, realities that we haven't realized. And Dalit people with disabilities uh, are the people who are at the very lowest bottom rank. And we can easily imagine uh, the dignified life or the, uh, the standard of life they are living. So I believe they are living a very miserable life uh, that we haven't realized. And there is uh, not um, a good recognition of the issues of Dalit with disabilities, because within the uh, disability movement it is not recognized, not even the Dalit uh, movement, overall general Dalit movement, the issues of the Dalit with disabilities are not recognized. And even uh, in other civic rights movement, it is not well recognized. Mainstreaming, it's a good strategy. We all say that, oh, we are mainstreaming these people with disabilities. That's a good strategy, but have we started? I mean, we talk about the living known behind, uh, but have we started? Is that enough? Uh, so the, there are big questions uh, on these uh, strategies. And uh, uh, I also believe that uh, there is lack of targeted programs for uh, Dalit people. Most of the time we talk about the blanket approach, oh, JC covers uh, these communities. Oh, uh, disability, we cover disability. That's why this covers the issues of the Dalit with disabilities. So these are the, you know, the ready-made answers that we get uh, when we talk about the targeted programs. And there is also lack of research and facts that uh, that shows that, that that is not you know bringing the issues of the Dalit with disabilities because there is no there is no data of Dalit with disabilities uh, from the national census or from na other national surveys and academic institutions. So we, we lack the data of the Dalit with disabilities. That's why our disease is not well recognized. And uh, from the Dalit, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dalit rights perspective, actually there is a need of transformation, but we haven't started the journey of reformation. So there is a big debate uh, whether to, you know, talk about the transformation or uh, start with the reformation. So there is a big debate. So I am uh, on my last slide. Uh, so I have a few uh, suggestions. So when we are talking about the uh, uh, Dalit with uh, disabilities, uh, as we know that they are facing multi-layer dis uh, discriminations, so they need uh, the empowerment initiatives. They are not even at the level to speak up they are not even the level to uh, uh, go to uh, or, or had to have access for the services. So we need uh, some empowerment initiatives for them. The second thing that we have to do is uh, we need to organize the Dalit uh, people with disabilities so that they can speak up their uh, issues and, and uh, they can you know, lead uh, their advocacy initiatives. Uh, third one is, of course, the inclusion, uh, but it should be a meaningful inclusion or the participation so that they are, they are, uh, they are not only to participate, but they are also in a, uh, in a capacity to contribute uh, to make the initiatives inclusive of themselves. We talk about mainstreaming. Uh, we have a big, you know, uh, inclusion uh, strategy, leaving no one behind, but are we in action? Are we bringing the LNOB in action? That's a big question. And um, my uh, fourth suggestion is, uh, if there is no collaboration uh, to, to address these big gaps 
or the needs of the Dalit with disabilities, then then we we won't have any you know improvement or any changes. That's why there is a huge need of collaboration and targeted actions. And as I said, uh, transformative uh, laws programs um, is another, another ways to address the issues of uh, Dalit with disabilities because they are historically you know, suppressed for many years and there is need of historical compensations to, for, for the sustainable development and to create the you know, peaceful society. So this is all from my side. Um, and I thank you all uh, for your time and listening to me and uh, giving me this opportunity to share some uh, thoughts uh, about the Dalit with disabilities. And I also, um, I'll be also waiting for your queries if there are any. Uh, thank you uh, very much and uh, over to you, Rogerio. Thank you so much, Mr. Padam Paris. You have, um, you gave a whole picture of the situation of Dalit with disabilities in Nepal. And I think it is really important, this topic. Um, before going to my colleague, Lauren, introduce our next speaker, I would like to thank all of the Bridge alumni that are here, that are attending here, Bridge alumni, alumni and Ida Fellow. And definitely, it's really great to have all of you here um, in this uh, special event in the context of the Global Disability Summit. Summit, especially this event organized by Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network, International Disability Alliance, Minority Rights Group, um, Vidas Negras for Deficiencias in Porto. Okay, now I'm going to pass the floor to my colleague, Lore, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Rosario, and thank you uh, again to Padam, uh, who gave an excellent uh, presentation on the situation of Dalits with disabilities across South Asia. It's an extremely important topic. Um, and I think you're asking very important questions on whether caste does matter in the disability, uh, in disability inclusion, which it definitely does. So thank you so much for raising the important issue as well. So I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker. Before I do so, I would just like to remind you that if you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function, or you can also type them in the chat and we will try to get some, to some after um, our, our last panel. So now I will introduce Lina Kondor, who is from Ukraine. She is a Roma woman's rights activist and lawyer at international charitable organization Roma Women Fund Chirikli. Chirikli started in 1994 to start resolving problems within the Roma communities in Ukraine and have seen very good results in the implementation of projects since. Chirikli are the first NGO to work uh, highlighting the situation of Roma with disabilities in Ukraine and with the support of MRG and with Roma community mediators they have been documenting the situation of Roma with disabilities since 2018. They have been advocating at the local and national levels for the health and social care needs of Roma with disabilities to be addressed in initiatives such as the National Roma Strategy. Lena will be speaking on addressing the health and social care needs of Roma people with disabilities in Ukraine. Lena, you have 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lauren. Just want to explain uh, Roma situation. Uh, there are uh, 400,000 of Roma people who live in Ukraine. And we know that there are 3 million of people with disabilities who are staying in Ukraine. And unfortunately, there is no desegregated data about Roma people with disabilities. Uh, I can tell that Roma people belong to the most marginalized communities in Ukraine and Europe. Unfortunately, all, all of the communities are segregated. Uh, most of them are staying out of cities. And uh, what we have in our fund, we have uh, 40, uh, 54 Roma and non-Roma mediators, people who work in communities and uh, state administrations. So these people come to the communities to find out 
their problems, difficulties, and bring them to the state administrations to solve them on state level. So uh, last uh, year, we were very happy with the results uh, of our uh, common convincing of Ministry of Social Policy of Ukraine to include uh, profession Roma Mediata into the state uh, job uh, classificator. And we won uh, after five years of uh, convincing this ministry. So impact of COVID-19, um, so what we uh, had, unfortunately we had lack of pandemic information, quarantine measures and instructions on COVID-19 prevention measures in Roma languages and accessible form formats. We also had uh, limited access to healthcare services, restricted access of education, stigmatization, and undermined economic stability of everyday learners. We also have uh, housing issues in Roma settlements, like uh, problems with the living conditions, very poor houses. Um, usually, the houses are overcrowded and have limited access to running water and sanitizers. As for the discrimination, I can tell that Roma women face intersectional discrimination based on gender, disability and ethnicity. Majority of Roma with disabilities are not registered as having a disability nor receive any benefits or support from the state. Most of uh, Roma have lack of documentation. Despite Roma face discrimination in social and medical services, we have a number of cases which prove these aspects. Everybody knows that Ukraine signed an adopted national Roma strategy in 2030 uh, last year. Unfortunately, provisions of this strategy are not under implementation of, in our uh, country. So uh, last year in autumn, MRG and uh, our fund, or Fond Chirikli, decided to apply to committee. A uh, committee works on protection of national minority rights in Ukraine. And we all together decided to create committee hearings. It happened in autumn last year. And uh, as a result, committee gave recommendations to local administrations to work on the elimination discrimination of Roma with disabilities and medical services. Besides, um, recommendation was given to find budget and covering the problems of Roma with disabilities. Uh, we call on states to pay special attention to the situation of Roma with disabilities to ensure that they are not left behind. States should ensure cohesion across the national disability strategies and Roma integration strategies, include Roma with disabilities in research and data collection, ensure representation of Roma with disabilities in all aspects of policy and decision making, and remove barriers to access to state social assistance for Roma with disabilities. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lena, very much for your excellent presentation on the situation of Roma with disabilities in Ukraine. Um, I think what you have been saying also echoes what many of the other speakers have been saying, there are some common issues around the lack of disaggregated data um, and lack of special attention in, in national initiatives and strategies. So uh, it's a real pleasure to hear about the work that Trickley have been doing on this. <laughs> So we are going to move now to Q&A. We have time for maybe a couple of questions. Um, so a question uh, from the panelists. 
yes, uh, for, for any of the panelists who would like to answer. Um, Christine Candy, who is a representative from the Endoroy community in Kenya, uh, she has asked, can we have a commitment from states on the rights of persons with disabilities, like in community education? Because most state officials don't understand about the rights of persons with disabilities, uh, which as it stands is a very big barrier in itself. So I wonder if any of our panellists would like to maybe speak to this question um, on how they have um, engaged in advocacy around uh, getting commitments uh, on states in terms of inclusive education and healthcare. Would anybody like to take that question? Luciana, please. Well, I, I'm not managing to share my screen. Wait a second. My, my screen is closed. I can't see the image. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Now it works. Well, at least here in Brazil, we have been thinking on ways regarding public policies because we had this episode during the pandemic here in Brazil, which was an episode where we were already advancing on the debate about inclusion, inclusive education and persons with disabilities were already participating and were enroll, enrolled in normal schools with adaptations, but there was a government decree that removed this possibility and gave the opportunity for the school to decide what is the best form of educating persons with disabilities. So now we have three ways, uh, bilingual schools for persons who cannot speak and persons who are deaf, and also inclusive schools who are, that are schools for only persons with disabilities. And this was very violent for us as a movement because we have been fighting for years in order to establish an inclusive policy. And then amidst the pandemic, this whole dynamic was reverted by the signature of the president. Movements were not heard. We tried to fight a lot against this. We tried to mobilize ourselves as much as we could within this new dynamic that is virtual, remote. However, we, we managed to suspend the, the decree, but the dynamic of establishing this debate about does people with disability should occupy normal spaces or spaces only for them? So now, persons with disability are increasingly being enrolled in special schools. And I believe that this is because we had this public debate during the pandemic. The government has put an announcement on the television in order for the whole Brazilian population to see that persons with disability in other spaces is good. So the whole population bought this idea. And then now we see that the, we have a lack of accessibility resources. We have lack of information. These children and teenagers, they, are, they didn't have the continuity of their studies during the pandemic and their family members in face of this whole situation, they are now preferring to put their children on special schools, schools that 
should be specialized in dealing with persons with disability. And what are we doing in order to change this? We are proposing public debates because we need to talk with the population and we need to, to retake this closer approach with the movements of caregivers and mothers of persons with disabilities, because this is the dynamic. What is happening now in Brazil is this notion that persons with disability are very difficult to deal with and that these people do not have the right to be on regular schools. So our movement goes against this. We are trying to welcome all of these family members that are tired of fighting for these rights that should be guaranteed. And we are explaining them the importance of inclusion as a whole and the importance of going back to regular schools. Because when we talk about inclusion of persons with disabilities, they are coming back from this pandemic to the school with a lot of mental health issues. So it is very important to think about education and accessibility as a whole. So our movement has been attempting to insert this into public debates, into conversations with schools, a closer approach with movements of mothers and caregiver, caregivers so this is an important issue. We need to understand that here in Brazil, we are reacting. At every five minutes, we have a direct attack from the government regarding removal of rights from persons with disability. At first, we had these special schools and then we had um, disability assessment. So we are trying to survive. We are trying to survive these attacks that we are facing constantly. I think uh, that's the reality of Brazil nowadays. Thank you so much. I mean, unfortunately, that time is our main enemy. And now I know that we have a lot of comments and questions in the chat box, but feel free to reach me anytime in the email. If, you, if somebody can write my email in the chat box, okay. Um, also, maybe feel free to reach uh, loading um, some of the speakers that are here. Um, now we are going to pass to the closing remarks of this session. We are going to introduce Olga Montufa. Olga Montufa is the co-chair of the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network. She's also president of the Fundación Paso a Paso in Mexico, and she is current president of the Latin America and the Caribbean Network of Indigenous Women with Disabilities. She will be doing the closing remarks. Olga, the floor is yours. Muchísimas gracias por brindarme la palabra. Ciertamente agradezco. Thanks for giving me the word. I'm Thank you the opportunity to be here on the closure of this event. Um, when it comes to uh, our people, we have historical challenges uh, and specifically uh, they are aggravated in, uh, when it comes to women. And not many things are known. And when it comes to the minorities, we are insisting that uh, it is known where are we uh, how many of us there is, what's happening to us, and we do not have uh, data about uh, different m minorities with uh, this capacity, and especially about what is happening uh, in the pandemics with them. Uh, we have to eliminate the intersectionalities with the system that uh, of oppression of identities, and we have to transform in a, a tool that serves us for inclusion. It is also necessary to sensibilize uh, the necessity to create public policies from a perspective of minorities. And in the case of the indigenous people with these uh, disabilities, it is very linked with 
uh, the convention uh, of, with the people of uh, and the CRPD. And we have to uh, work uh, with knowledge of the necessities that these people have, for example, uh, the structure uh, that we are thinking not only about uh, minorities, but we have to think about uh, children and uh, the old ones. We need to work a lot to eradicate the policies which are creating only paternalism and which uh, we have to work and call the governments uh, for their obligation to create these policies. Places. We recommend also, especially in these processes of talking about intersectionalities, of the renovating of the conception of the faith, we need to work and, and update this concept, concepts because the stereotypes and stigma are they need to be eradicated, eradicated and we needed to work a lot to achieve that. It is important that there are also pr protocols for migrants and uh, which also have to do with minorities. This is very important to do now because uh, uh, with the pandemics, a lot of our population with uh, uh, indigenous uh, and um, with African descendant, they are searching. Uh, they are searching countries to uh, survive. I want to uh, give thanks to everyone who uh, are participating in this event, to the interpreters, to everyone who are participating, and uh, to uh, advise that everyone ha has a different look on all of the uh, the things, and that we can look at intersectionalities. Uh, at, as the tool to uh, help us all. Uh, thanks a lot for your support. Thank you so much, Olga. Thank you all of you for being part of this wonderful panel. And definitely, as an um, intersectionalities officer, I, am, I commit myself to work harder in order to include this international approach for OPDs and also for other stakeholders. Definitely, it's very important for us and to not only for this event, especially in, in all of our work at International Stability Alliance. Thank you so much to all of you for attending. Thanks everyone. Can I just ask pan panelists to stay for a minute and open your cameras so we can take a group picture before we let you all go. Great. I think I can. Oh, Padam, can you put your camera on so we can take a photo? Amanase, um, if you're still there. Great. Jaria, feel free to turn your camera on if you want to be part of the photo as well. And the interpreters as well, if you would like to join. You're an important part of our event. Uh, and thank you so much for making it accessible. Okay, if everyone is ready, say 